Hi and thank you for watching. As promised previously, in this video we will be looking at what God's Word shows us concerning salvation and the need for us to confess our sins after we have received salvation. I know that I sometimes assume that others would see things in the same light that I do and consider God's Word in the same way that I do and as a result my explanations may sometimes lack some detail. So in this video I would like to try and clarify what I believe God's Word shows us about salvation and how confessing our sins fit into the picture. Now I know that I am not perfect either and I am fallible too and my aim is not to attack anyone's beliefs. I am simply sharing a perspective that is built on as much of God's Word as possible because only when we consider all of God's Word can we have the assurance that we are getting close to the truth. So I hope that what I share with you today will bless you and provide a little more clarity for those who felt confused about what I shared in previous videos. You may need to watch this video several times as there will be a lot of information contained in it and it would also be good to study these passages that are provided further on your own. So when it comes to God's Word and our doctrine, I believe 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 instructs us on how to build our doctrine and that our beliefs have to be based on everything written in both the Old and New Testaments. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Paul tells us that everything written in God's Word was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that when we consider everything that was written, it will profit us if we want our doctrine to be based on the truth. When we consider this passage, why does Paul mention reproof, correction, and instruction when it comes to doctrine? I believe the Holy Spirit inspired him to include these words, because today many doctrines out there are not built on everything written in God's Word. Most doctrines are built on selected passages that support a particular belief, while passages that contradict that belief are simply ignored or discarded. If God's Word is the only source of truth in this world, we do not want everything written in His Word to align with what you believe. Jesus said the following in John 14 verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in John chapter 1, this is what is said about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If Jesus is the Word, and if He is the Word that was made flesh, is there anything about the Word that we should not consider when we build our doctrine? Many will say the Old Testament is not important to believers today, as it formed part of a different dispensation which concerned different people, and that dispensation and instructions were replaced with something better, so we no longer have to concern ourselves with what was written in it. Is that really true? I want to show you how such an approach to God's Word is a lie from the enemy. Here is something to consider. Do you know of any instances in which what was written in the following passage from Leviticus 27 was ever fulfilled? Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Through the ages, do you know of any instance in which a person who was devoted or holy to God had to be put to death because they could not be redeemed or be sold? At first glance, this would seem to be a very strange instruction or something that would seem to make no sense, as those who were devoted to God would not need redemption since they are already devoted to God and therefore holy. So what is going on here? Believe it or not, the first time this passage will ever apply to people will be during the upcoming tribulation, which is described to us in the very last book of the New Testament. This is the first instance since the instruction was given to Moses and Leviticus that people who are devoted or holy to God will find themselves in a situation where they cannot be redeemed or sold because they have become the property of a new owner, the Antichrist. The only way for those who are holy to God to remain holy to God during the tribulation is to be put to death, 
and we see this clearly explained in the book of Revelation. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. These two passages show us how an instruction that was given in Leviticus 27 will be applied to people for the first time during the tribulation, where those who want to remain holy to God will have two choices. They can either lay down their lives for God and remain holy to Him, or, if they refuse, take their new owner's mark in their body and become the permanent property of their new owner. I explain this in more detail in a five-part series if you have not seen it yet, and I only provide this one example to make a point. If we do not know what is written in Leviticus 27, we will have no idea why those who are holy to God have to die during the tribulation. We cannot obtain the truth of God's word if we do not include everything that was written in both the Old and New Testaments in our doctrine. What we believe must not be contradicted by any passage written in God's word. Now this may sound like something very difficult to achieve since there are so many doctrines and denominations and all of them agree to an extent with certain sections of God's word while other sections of God's word would seem to contradict what they believe. If anything that we believe is contradicted by a passage from God's word, should we not stop and say, wait a minute, how can what I believe be true if this passage from God's word says the exact opposite? Here is another example. When it comes to the rapture, there are five main perspectives that people would seem to align themselves with, and these are as follows. A partial rapture, a pre-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation rapture, a pre-wrath rapture, a post-tribulation rapture. Ask yourself this, why are there five main views regarding the rapture, and how is it possible that people who read the same book arrive at such differing views regarding this subject? I believe this comes about because people adopt a certain limited perspective about the subject that is supported by selecting a specific set of passages that support that perspective, while they ignore, discard or oppose those passages that support the other views. Instead of then trying to figure out how the other views fit into the picture, they would rather blindly argue for their own view, and against the other views, and those who oppose them do the same. When we build our doctrine with an approach to eliminate contradictions with God's word, in other words, if we find that a specific passage contradicts what we believe, then I believe we have to adjust our doctrine or belief to align with and include that specific passage in such a way that the contradiction is removed. When we do this, we discover that all five of these rapture views are in fact valid. When we consider this through the harvest and temple models, and that the differences come about because people do not know God's word and how models that are provided were intended for us to understand certain principles. Instead, most would rather choose sides in these matters and then use their selected set of passages to defend their view, not knowing that they are only looking at a partial picture. One last example I would like to provide is this one. When will the new heavens and earth be created? The majority of believers will place this event at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, simply because this is where this event is described in Revelation. However, if that is what we believe, we have not thoroughly studied God's word on this matter. First, we have this passage from Mark chapter 13. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. This passage tells us about the condition of the earth in the last days that will be so severe that our Heavenly Father will have to shorten the day so that some people, specifically the nation of Israel, who will enter the millennial reign in mortal bodies, will make it through. If the new heavens and new earth are only created at the end of the millennial reign, where will these people live for that thousand years? 
Most will say, God will restore the earth so that it can be inhabited during the millennial reign. But, such a belief would contradict what is written in Isaiah 24, where we read the following. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. The earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Here we are shown that the earth will be destroyed specifically because of the world's sin, and because the kings of the earth parted God's land, which was given to Israel as an everlasting covenant. In verse 20, it specifically states that when the earth falls, when it is judged because of the sin that is upon it, it will not rise again. Can you see how a belief in which we say that God will restore this earth after the tribulation completely contradicts this passage? If we had any doubt about the timing of when this destruction of the earth will take place, we only have to look at verse 21 in which the imprisonment of Satan in the pit is described which happens on the same day that the earth is destroyed, at the start of the millennial reign of Christ, not at the end. And this is further confirmed for us in Revelation 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. This current earth is destroyed on the same day that Satan is imprisoned for one thousand years. This happens at the end of the tribulation, which then leads into the millennial reign of Christ. If the earth is therefore destroyed without the option of restoration at the end of the tribulation, and the Bible describes a world that is created for people to live in, in which death will still be a factor, and where the healing of nations will require the leaves of the tree of life which stands in New Jerusalem. It is clear that the only understanding that does not contradict God's word is that Jesus will create the new heavens and the new earth at the end of the tribulation. Please read Isaiah 65 and Revelation 21 and 22 for more information on this, and note how sin, death and sickness will still be an issue that will be dealt with on the new earth. If we try to build our doctrine on reading just a single passage about any subject from God's Word, we are going to miss the target. God's Word is designed in such a way that we can discover the truth if we follow the connections that are provided to other passages and ensure that we include all of the information provided to arrive at an understanding that does not contradict what is written. The same is true for dealing with sin after salvation, where many believe that confessions of sin after we are saved are either something evil or not necessary or part of a works-based salvation doctrine in which we are somehow adding to what Jesus did for us on the cross when we confess our sins to him. Let me try to explain this in the following way. When we believe that Jesus is the Son of God who shed his blood that cleanses us of our sins, we receive salvation according to what is written in Romans 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what happens when we receive salvation, which was something foretold in the Old Testament? When we are saved, we receive a robe of Jesus' righteousness, which is something that can only be obtained through faith. There is no work that we can do to obtain it, it is a free gift that we receive from God through His grace towards us, as a result of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, who is the Son of God. Romans 3 tells us that when we are saved, our past sins are also forgiven and washed away, and at the moment of salvation we stand before Jesus dressed in garments of salvation, 
which is also referred to as robes of his righteousness, without spot or wrinkle, and with all our sins washed away. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So at the moment of our salvation we are perfectly clean before the Lord, having been washed by his blood. However, after that point, we continue to live in mortal bodies of sin. We have sinful natures and desires, and our lives continue in a sinful world, in a corrupted body of flesh. It is therefore important to understand how the sins that we commit after we are saved affect us according to what is written in God's word. Once again, we have to ensure that what we believe aligns perfectly with God's word in such a way that there are no contradictions between what we believe and what is written. We cannot ignore certain parts of the Bible as many today choose to do if we want to know the truth, especially if those parts are instructions to believers on how to deal with sin after salvation. Now before we dive deeper into this, I have to point out what I believe our Heavenly Father tells us regarding His will for His creation, and this also has to be incorporated into our understanding when we look at salvation and the confession of sins. We read the following in Colossians chapter 1. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. According to what is written in this passage, our Heavenly Father plans to reconcile all things with himself through Jesus, including things that are in heaven. What things in heaven would require reconciliation with our Heavenly Father? Could it be that these things are the angels, the authorities, and powers that we wrestle with currently? Please consider the following three passages. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven, and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Mark chapter 12 is one of several passages in which it is clearly stated that it is the angels that are in heaven, and when Colossians chapter 1 tells us about our Heavenly Father's desire to be reconciled with things that are in heaven, this can only refer to the fallen angels, and they are the only entities who would be found in heaven requiring reconciliation with God. No human would be able to enter heaven while they are not already reconciled with God, and our Heavenly Father would not make any mistakes in this regard. We see in 1 Peter 3 that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and ascension into heaven have made the principalities and powers against which we wrestle subject unto him, when Jesus took back the authority over the earth that was handed to Satan by Adam and Eve. That authority is also imputed to us who believe according to Mark 16. This does not mean that the powers and principalities which are in heaven have been reconciled with our Heavenly Father as described in Colossians 1. So if our Heavenly Father plans to bring this reconciliation about, it is a plan for the future which we have not seen yet, 
and the timing of this event is not clear to us, but I suspect that most of this reconciliation will occur at the start of the millennial reign of Christ. Now many will say that salvation is only offered to humanity and that there is no option or opportunity for the fallen angels and demons to be reconciled with God. Well, if we read Colossians 1 and considering that this was inspired by the Holy Spirit, it is clearly stated that through Jesus' work on the cross, reconciliation with all things is what our Heavenly Father sees as an intended outcome. We actually have more supporting scripture that we have to consider in this regard. Please think about the implications of the following. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast seen well, for I will hasten my word to perform it, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Here we see that in addition to planning to be reconciled with all of his creation, our Heavenly Father sees to it that what is written in his word is carried out and performed according to his will. It is not his will for any to perish, and his word declares to us things that are not yet done, but it also points out that he will show us more of his incredible love in the ages to come. Have you ever considered the fact that the Bible tells us nothing about what happens after the millennial reign, only that there are more ages to come, and that these will concern God's incredible love towards us? If God's will is to be reconciled with all of his creation, and his will is for none to perish, do you think he would not have a plan to bring about his will in this regard? I'm of the opinion that just as in the case of Adam and Eve, who from their point of view could not see the coming salvation that would arrive 4,000 years later, where even their sins would be washed away by the perfect Lamb of God, there are many aspects about our Heavenly Father that we cannot see from our perspective especially if we are willing to ignore or reject certain passages from his word. Now another passage that we have to consider when it comes to the topic of salvation is the following. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Ask yourself this, why would the Holy Spirit inspire John to tell us that Jesus' payment on the cross is not only for the sins of those that believe, but also for the whole world? If Jesus paid the price for the forgiveness of sins, not just for those who would believe in him, but also for the entire world, does this not point to our Heavenly Father's plan to bring about what is written in Colossians 1? Three years ago, we may not have known exactly how he would do this, but the past three years have provided us with so much insight into how our Heavenly Father plans to accomplish this, and how Satan will lose everything that he worked so hard for over the past 6,000 years, because he transgressed God's harvest law. Another passage in which the same understanding is found comes from 1 Timothy. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, specially of those that believe. What does Paul mean when he writes that God is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe? The first impression this gives us, if we think about this for a while, is that those who believe in Jesus are favored over those who don't. And it is certainly something that we need to understand at the hand of Scripture. It will also leave one with an understanding that believers will escape whatever non-believers will have to endure. Otherwise, there would be no difference. Keep this in mind, as our Heavenly Father also has favorites among those who are saved. And this is shown to us in the following passage. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory? In the parable of the talents we see that talents given to those who did nothing with them will be taken from them and given to those who have the most. 
Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. I believe that how we respond to God's word, and how close we are to the truth when it comes to what we believe, will play a big role in determining the kind of vessel that we become. Secondly, what we do with the gifts and talents that we receive and the level of intimacy we have with our Heavenly Father will also play a role in the position that we receive in the kingdom, but it also determines the timing of our entry into that kingdom. Adam and Eve did not understand God's plan when he demonstrated the model of salvation to them through the coats of skin that he made which were obtained through the shedding of blood. This pointed them to the robes of righteousness that Jesus would provide to all who would be washed by his blood and that there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. In the same way, from our position in time, we are not able to see all of our Heavenly Father's plans for the future, but if we diligently read His Word and pay attention to the details, it is clear that He has an amazing plan to bring about reconciliation with all of His creation at some point in time, somewhere in the future. The point I would like to make by sharing this with you is that eventually all things in God's creation will be reconciled with Him, since that is his will according to Colossians chapter 1. And with God all things are possible, and there is nothing that would prevent him from doing what pleases him. Even though we may not have a full understanding of this right now and know exactly how we will accomplish it, he is able and intent on bringing that reconciliation about. The most important aspect that we need to focus on is to be ready to join the bridegroom for the wedding, which is the next opportunity for believers to enter God's kingdom. Our beliefs, the choices that we make, and how close our doctrine is to the truth of God's word will determine whether we are found worthy and ready and whether we would be allowed to enter into his kingdom. Some will be allowed in at this opportunity, which is also known as the rapture, while most will be turned away after never expecting to encounter a closed door, and they will have to wait for the next opportunity which occurs after the wedding. And I will show this to you from God's word. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. This passage from Matthew 25 describes the five wise virgins who were ready to meet the bridegroom, having oil in their lamps and their lamps burning. The next passage describes the foolish virgins' opportunity to meet the bridegroom. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. When we read these two sections of scripture, we can clearly see how a group who is expecting the bridegroom is split into two. Both are expecting and waiting for the bridegroom, but only those that were ready and who were found to be worthy will be allowed to attend the wedding with the bridegroom. The foolish and the unwise who discovered that they are not allowed into the wedding are addressed in this passage from Luke, and Jesus speaks volumes to them if we pay close attention to what is said. First, Jesus says that their loins have to be girded about when he returns for them. What does this mean? The answer is given in Ephesians chapter 6, where we are told that the truth is what we need to gird our loins with. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. These believers held to doctrines that deviated from the truth, and as such Jesus tells them to make sure that they know the truth, so that they can open the door to him when he returns from the wedding. Jesus also tells them to ensure that their lights are burning, pointing to the fact that they did not consider all of God's word in their doctrine, and therefore did not have a light to show them the right way to walk in. The truth of God's word is the light that burns in us when we know the truth. None. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. For the commandment is a lamp, the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. What did the wise virgins tell the foolish virgins when they discovered that their oil ran out? And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. 
The truth is not something that we can impute to someone else. It is something that each person has to obtain for themselves, as the Holy Spirit reveals it to them from God's Word. I believe this is why we read the following in Proverbs 23. Buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Wisdom, understanding and the truth are things that cannot simply be transferred between people. One can show the way to someone else, but it is each person's own responsibility to obtain these qualities and aspects for themselves. Our Heavenly Father will, in my opinion, judge every person individually regarding these and that is why I think the wise virgins told the foolish virgins that they could not share with them what they had. This also includes one's relationship with the bridegroom. A person's relationship with someone else cannot be transferred to another person. Each person has to establish a relationship with the bridegroom for themselves. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. In James 1 we see how those who were begotten by the word of truth will be a kind of first fruits, once again pointing us to the harvest pattern that involves a sequence of events that occur in a specific order. Those who have the truth will be allowed into the kingdom and be part of the wedding before those who still need to find it. Those who do not know the truth will not miss the kingdom, but their entry into the kingdom will be delayed and their position in God's kingdom will diminish at each missed opportunity. Can you see how these passages provide us with further insight on what is said in Matthew 25 and Luke 12? Revelation 3 then describes this exact situation when the bridegroom returns from the wedding and knocks on the door of those who missed the wedding. This situation specifically applies to the church of Laodicea, the church that is spewed out of the mouth of God because it is neither hot nor cold. This church thinks that it is rich and that it has need of nothing, but they are deceived. They think they know the truth but they have followed false doctrines because God's word and the truth was not that important to them. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door, and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. There are many doctrines going around today, and many of them only incorporate part of God's word. One that is especially deceptive is the rightly dividing doctrine, which suddenly sprang up shortly after the Revelation 12 sign occurred in 2017. If we want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, we need to consider every jot and every tittle of God's word, as those sections that are not speaking directly to us are providing understanding into what our Heavenly Father is saying to us. And once again, I refer to the example I showed you earlier from Leviticus 27. If we believe a lie because we choose to only read selected passages from God's word, our lights will not be lit and we will be in need of reproofs and instruction. And this is further emphasized in 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now coming back to salvation and the confession of sins. Please consider the next passage with me, one that I quoted in several previous videos, where important information is shared with us. Here we have a discussion between Jesus and Peter, where Jesus offers to wash Peter's feet, and where Peter first refused this offer. Jesus then explains the consequences of not allowing him to wash his feet. Please listen carefully to what is said in the following passage. After that he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? 
Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. What is our Heavenly Father showing us here? First, Jesus tells Peter that if he does not allow him to wash his feet, Peter would have no part in him. Next, Jesus tells Peter that those who have been washed, in other words, those who have been saved or who have received salvation and who are therefore dressed in a robe of Jesus' righteousness, need not to be washed again except for their feet. We know that Peter was a believer according to Romans 10 verse 9 to 10 because in John 6 we read the following regarding Peter. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. There are also passages from the other Gospels in which Peter clearly declares his faith in Jesus as being the Son of God, granting him salvation according to Romans 10. Now knowing that Peter's faith in Jesus accounted him righteous in God's eyes according to Hebrews 11, think about the following carefully. Why would Jesus include this passage from John 13 to show us a requirement for people who have been washed or who have been saved to have their feet washed again by Jesus after salvation or risk having no part in him? What do you do with this instruction when it comes to your doctrine? Does your doctrine have a solid explanation for this and incorporate this understanding into what you believe? Or does this statement by Jesus leave you with some doubts? Can we simply ignore this passage because it was not written by Paul? Surely, when Jesus tells Peter that he that is washed only needs his feet to be washed, Jesus was not speaking to an unbeliever about salvation that he still had to obtain. In fact, when Peter asked Jesus to wash also his head and his hands, Jesus tells Peter that Peter doesn't need to be washed to that extent since he had already been washed. The answer that Jesus gave Peter in this regard shows us that Jesus considered Peter as someone who had been washed and therefore being a saved believer. So it would be very difficult to argue that Peter was still unsaved at the point where he had this discussion with Jesus. So what does it mean to have one's feet washed by Jesus after salvation? We have to ask God's word about this. When we continue to live in this world after we receive salvation, we encounter sin in this world where our feet will constantly be in contact with substances that are considered filthy. The sins that we commit after our salvation, according to Jesus' own words, require a separate washing. Did Jesus pay for the sins that we commit after we are saved? Absolutely. He even paid for the sins of those who do not believe. But will they be found ready for the wedding? Absolutely not. Does Jesus' payment for the sins that we commit after we are saved automatically apply to all the sins that we commit after we are saved? When we study God's word in this regard, we see that if automatic forgiveness of sin applied to us, we would not need any washing of our feet as shown in the conversation between Jesus and Peter. Ephesians 5 shows us that Jesus needs to wash us so that he can present us to himself without spot or wrinkle. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Some may argue that Peter had this conversation before Jesus paid the price for his sins on the cross and therefore could not have been a recipient of salvation. Once again, if we test this argument against God's word, we see that salvation does not rely on the timing of when a person came to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and whether that occurred before Jesus died on the cross or after. In Hebrews 11, we see how several Old Testament saints are declared righteous in the eyes of God because of their faith in Jesus as the Son of God, long before he died for their sins on the cross. So there is no difference between Peter believing that Jesus is the Son of God before he died on the cross and us believing the same after he shed his blood for our sins. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. 
for before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Another question that some may ask is this, how would the washing of one's feet be applied to the Old Testament saints who believed but who may not have known that their feet required washing? This is actually addressed in 1 Peter chapter 3, where the elders are once again described to us. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This passage from Peter shows us that the elders of the Old Testament that are named in Hebrews 11 were also disobedient and sinful, and because of their sins they were kept in a prison known as Abram's bosom or paradise, until payment for their sins could be made. Their sins that had not yet been paid for prevented them from being with God when they died, even though they were declared righteous because of their faith. When Jesus provided that payment through his blood, he went to tell them the good news and to set them free. These were resurrected with him as the first fruits of the faith harvest, who were the very first to receive glorified bodies, and who appeared to many in Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection for a period of forty days. These were the very first to enter God's kingdom, and this was also the first opportunity that God provided for a group of people to enter into his kingdom. What is important to note is that the elders who died were separated from their sinful flesh while they waited for the blood of the Lamb to pay for their sins. This is important to understand as our existence in sinful flesh while we are alive is the reason why we need a separate washing that washes the spots and wrinkles from our garments of salvation. When we look at the tribulation saints, we know that Leviticus 27 tells us that those who are devoted to God living during the tribulation will have to be put to death if they want to remain holy to God. And here we see once again that it is only the washing in the blood of the Lamb that is mentioned showing us that these believers have also been separated from their sinful flesh through death. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So what is the difference between the elders of the Old Testament, believers who have died since Jesus' payment for sins on the cross, the tribulation saints, and believers who will be alive at the time of the rapture? God's word clearly shows us that those who are alive at the time of the rapture are the only ones who will be required to have their feet washed to remove spots and wrinkles from their garments. The reason for this is the fact that we live in sinful bodies as believers and our flesh, its nature, its desires and its actions is what causes filth to deposit on our garments. So at the time of the rapture, those who are alive and who exist in sinful bodies of flesh will have to present themselves to the bridegroom and we are shown through God's word that we will either be found in a soiled robe if we fail to allow Jesus to wash our feet or we will be standing before him in a clean robe which he would have washed because we allowed him to do so. And only those who are standing before him in a clean robe will be allowed to enter the wedding. Once again, this only applies to believers that are alive in bodies of flesh at the time of the rapture. Believers who have died, even though they may not have confessed their sins to God, have been separated from that which caused spots and wrinkles and have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I hope this makes sense, but I will provide further proof. The only way in which those who are alive will be found worthy and will be allowed into the wedding is if they have closely watched the condition of their garments and have asked the bridegroom to cleanse them whenever the Holy Spirit convicts them of something that is offensive to God. And it is the bridegroom who does the washing, not us. We are simply allowing him to wash our feet. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it 
that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Have you ever asked yourself, why is Jesus washing the church in the water of the word and not in the blood of the Lamb? Secondly, does the Bible tell us clearly what the spots and wrinkles are that are removed by the washing of water? God's word shows us that the blood of the Lamb is the price that Jesus paid so that we can receive salvation and the remission of sins or removal of past sins at the time of our salvation and to be incorporated into the body which is the church or the temple of God. It also serves as payment for those sins that will be washed by the water of the word while we are alive as the blood of Jesus pays for the sins of the whole world. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God. What are the spots that have to be washed from our garments? This is specifically addressed in Jude. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. In verse 23 of the book of Jude, we are told that it is our flesh that brings about the spots on our garments, and that we should hate spotted garments. The next question we need to ask is this, if all our sins past, present and future are dealt with when we are saved, as many popular doctrines today would have us believe, why do we read about garments that have spots on them and that they require washing by the water of God's word and that it is our task to save believers with spotted garments by pulling them out of the fire? This is the understanding that our Heavenly Father has given me. When we are alive on this earth, we live in the flesh which remains sinful until we die and we put off our sinful flesh. Those who die as believers at any time, even during the tribulation, are washed in the blood of the Lamb, as the washing with the water of the Word only applies to the living who are afflicted by sinful flesh. When we are alive on earth, our flesh will continue to cause spots to appear on our garments, and we need Jesus to wash these away with the water of the Word, so that we can stand before Him without spots or wrinkles, when the doors to the wedding open. This is done through the instructions provided to us in 1 John 1 verse 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. When a believer is saved, they receive a garment of Jesus' righteousness, and all their past sins are forgiven through the payment that Jesus made with the blood that he shed for us. As that believer then continues to live on this earth, they continue to sin, and although Jesus paid the price for those sins to be forgiven, we need to allow Jesus to wash us clean by confessing our sins to him, just as Peter, who was a saved believer, had to allow Jesus to wash his feet, or we run the risk of having no part in him. When we confess the sins that the Holy Spirit convicts us of, Jesus cleanses us not only from those sins that we confessed, but also from all other sins and unrighteousness. If we refuse to confess our sins to Jesus, then we are like Peter, telling Jesus that he will never wash our feet, and we should then expect not to have any part in him, especially at the time of the wedding. The bridegroom's wedding is soon happening, and as this appointment and blessed hope approaches, possibly being only days away, it is extremely important that we watch our garments and keep them clean, And this is pointed out to us in two instances in the book of Revelation. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. 
Can you see how these passages show us that those who wash their garments and who ensure that they are clean by allowing Jesus to wash them clean are the ones who are said to be worthy to walk with Jesus in white? This of course is also connected to the passage from Luke where the following is written. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. David also states in Psalm 32 that godly people who live in a time when Jesus may be found, which is when the bridegroom arrives for his wedding, will be confessing their sins to him. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. So when we confess our sins, we are simply allowing Jesus to prepare us for the wedding. He is the one that is doing all the work. And if we are not allowing him to cleanse us of the offenses that the sins of our flesh cause, then we are like Peter telling the Lord that he will never wash our feet and we then choose to stand before him in a robe that is soiled. We are also choosing to be left outside during the upcoming wedding. Confessing our sins to Jesus is not trying to earn or keep our salvation, or to do works with which we are trying to pay him back for what he did for us. It is simply humbling ourselves before Jesus who wants to cleanse us every time sin causes spots or wrinkles on our robes of his righteousness. When we do this, we honor our Savior because his word shows us that sin is an offense to him. If we choose to stand before him in our unconfessed sin, it simply points to a relationship where there is no intimacy and where we have no idea or do not care how our sins offend our Savior. One can compare this to a marriage where one of the spouses has no idea that their actions offend the other spouse and where this spouse never even considers apologizing for their offensive behavior. Do you think that intimacy will be promoted between the spouses when such a situation prevails? and where one of the spouses simply does not care how their actions affect the other. God looks at those who humble themselves before him, and those are the ones that he will allow into his kingdom next. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Those who do not watch their garments and who are found with spots on their garments at the time of the wedding do not lose their salvation. They are simply missing the next opportunity to enter the kingdom of God. Another opportunity comes when Jesus returns from the wedding to set up his everlasting kingdom on the earth. During the tribulation, entry into God's kingdom is only possible for a believer when they allow themselves to be put to death by refusing the mark that the enemy will attempt to place on all who dwell on the earth during this time. Well, this was a mouthful, and I hope this will explain the subject a little better, and hopefully give a better understanding. I still feel that my explanation may not be as clear as it could be, but I pray that the Holy Spirit will convey the message in a way that will be understood by all. I hope that you will also consider the scriptures and passages provided, and do your own study into this matter. There are great resources available such as eSword with which you can easily search out scriptures concerning specific topics. In South Africa we have severe electricity cuts at the moment and it is taking me a lot longer to make videos. I do believe that our heavenly wedding is fast approaching, so this may very well be my last video, but if we are still here in a few weeks from now, I will do my best to continue to make more videos as led by our Heavenly Father. I hope this video has blessed you and until next time, or until we meet in the air, God bless.